Hi guys and welcome back. This is part three of my miniature landscape painting demo. I'm going to take a second here and uh, show you the colors I'm using. These are the same ones that I used to do the block in. These are Rembrandt colors and this is all I'm going to be using to do the first painting stage just like I did the block in. The difference here is that I'm going to get a little bit more sophisticated with the color mixtures and I'm not going to limit myself to the set of premixed colors that I made uh, like I did in the block in. I only made about eight or nine colors and I stuck to those. I didn't change them very much. But for this stage in the painting process, it's it's a good idea to pre-mix some colors, but you want to allow yourself the freedom to change them a little bit. And that's what you're going to see me do quite a bit. Now here I'm just uh, setting myself up to paint the sky. And I have an idea as to where I want to go with it. And I've gone ahead and I've mixed up one color and I'm working on the second. But what you're going to see me do here in just a moment is combine the two of them because I changed my mind and uh, about the approach I wanted to take. See here I'm mixing up two distinct colors and I felt that it would be better to mix up a main value, you know, like a, a foundation value, and then just lift the value with some white. So that's what I'm about to do here. I felt it was a better approach to take. So I'm still mixing up that that core color that I want to use. And in a moment you'll see me combine the two of them. And then I just take whatever's left over on the brush and add white to it and that becomes the second color. Now when I'm done with this, I will mix up the blue, just a basic blue color for the sky. And uh, of course I'll be allowing myself the freedom to change that around as I see fit. But once I get these three main values in, I'm going to go ahead and start with the painting. And I say value, but what I mean is uh, hue, color, different values of the color. Like this one here, this is just the same color I mixed plus white, so it's lighter in value. And then I'll go ahead and mix up the blue. Now, once I've got the sky colors pretty much mapped out like this, I'm going to take a cosmetic sponge and you can get these at um, stores like Target and Walmart, just these little cosmetic wedges. And what I do is I apply two or three drops of linseed oil to the sponge and then I deposit a little bit of it onto the palette. And I use that a little bit later on to prime the brush. And then what I do is I oil in the painting. And when we get to that point, I'll explain a little bit more about what that is. Still working on that color. I'm trying to get a match and I've got the palette right next to the painting so I can see when I'm getting it right and when I'm not. Okay, so here's that cosmetic sponge. I put a little bit on uh, put a little bit of it on the palette. And then I just very lightly moisten the surface of the canvas with this and that is to restore the value of the painting if any of the colors have sunken in uh, due to the canvas absorbing the oil. And it also moistens the surface so I can paint into a wet surface. Now this is not dripping wet by any means. That's very, very, uh, very, very minimal application there. And I did go ahead and coat the entire canvas. I just didn't show it. Now here I'm priming the brush and the oil. This is just to get it wet. And then I'll go into the first color and begin the painting. Now I check it. It's the first thing I usually do. 
make sure I've got the value correct and also that the color is correct, or at least more or less what I want. I can always push it around if I need to, like I'm doing right here. Check it again. Looks like it's good, so I'm going to keep going. Now this application, I should mention this, the colors there have a little bit of linseed oil mixed into them, and the the thought process there is that the paint at this stage in the game needs to have more oil, uh, more oil content than the previous layer. Now in the block in, I didn't actually put any medium into the paint except for the white because the white was really stiff and I needed to get the white to the same consistency as the other colors. But in this case, I've added a little bit of oil to every color so that the overall oil content of the paint is higher than it was for the block in. That combined with the oiling out of the painting and the priming of the brush just overall creates more of a, of a oily paint application than the previous layer. And that's known as um, the process is known as the fat over lean uh, concept. There's a there's something called the fat over lean rule that says that each layer of paint needs to have more oil content than the previous layer, and that's exactly what I'm doing here. So it's not that I've just squeezed the colors out onto the palette. They have been pre-mixed uh, with a little bit of linseed oil to fatten them up a little bit. That's not the same as thinning. Uh, this comes up a lot. Thinning is what you do when you add a solvent. And a solvent is also referred to as a thinner, and that's why it's called a thinner, because instead of adding oil to your paint, you are adding something that will evaporate and then not be in the paint film any longer. I'm not going to get too specific about that, but that's generally the concept. So in the sky, a little bit about the sky here, you'll, you'll notice me using the, the primary colors I'm using are the ones that I mixed. But every once in a while, I like to go straight into one of the primaries to bump it around a little bit. But for the most part, you're not going, and I do it a couple times, but you're not going to see me take the color, <laughs> well, there it is, take the color straight from the primary and put it on the canvas. I know I do that a couple more times, but when you do that, you run the risk of putting down something that doesn't necessarily belong. And if you don't know what to do to fix it, it could cause some problems. So there's there's one more point coming up here where I do it and then I, I hesitate because I thought, oh, that's not right. And I'll point that out when we get to it. But as a general rule of thumb, you, if you're going to paint like this, you need to pre-mix whatever colors you're going to put up on the canvas on your palette first. Now, even though it looks like I'm just being a little redundant, you know, painting over the same area more than <laughs> five minutes at a time, I'm actually I'm actually thinking about the brush strokes there. If you put too much paint down and you leave too much texture there too soon, it's it's difficult when you when you get to the next layer and you have to deal with all these bumps and ridges. So, I like to make an effort to smooth the paint out as much as I can until the final layer and then I'll just more or less cake it on there. But even in this in this modeling stage, I'm still conscious of the texture. 
So the reason I'm going over it so many times is to smooth it out and blend those colors together. Now there I've gone directly to the canvas with the blue and in that particular case it, it was fine. I was able to work it in. And I've picked up some of that lighter color and I'm taking it over to suggest some clouds. Now I remember when I was doing the block in, I hadn't really intended to put any clouds in. But having a week to look at the painting, you know, you, you have some time to make some decisions. And I thought, oh, well, you know what, it would actually help to have some clouds in there. So that's what I'm doing. Now there's that color. That does not belong there. So uh, making an effort to fix it. And as I do that, I think to myself, oh, that looks nice. Let me put some of that up in the, in the corner here because I, I like that darker value. And overall, what I'm doing with the sky is I'm increasing the dynamic of the sky. Before I started this, the overall tone of the sky was pretty even. But what I'm going for is more of a dynamic range between the light and the dark. So over on the left, I have lightened the value. And here on the right, I'm darkening the value. So it creates a little bit more of a contrast in the sky and it makes the sky more interesting. Over the past few days, I've been thinking I really want to do that. So you can totally change your mind and that is a recurring theme that you will see more than once in this presentation. <laughs> As a matter of fact, I completely rearrange the composition of the foreground. The, uh, the idea was to have this be sort of a wide shot and not really have any foreground elements. But then I thought, I really need to push the contrast, you know, between my values, between my depth. And the only way to do that is to change the value structure and change the composition. So what you'll see as we get further forward in space is more of a conscious effort to increase the depth of the painting from an aerial perspective. So that mountain does need to be lifted in value. It's too dark. And I know that I, uh, I had that in mind before when I did the block in, I thought it was too dark and I still think it's too dark. So that's going to be addressed. And a couple other things along those lines will be taken care of as well. It's important to note that the purpose of this stage is not to finish the painting, but to resolve it a little bit more with some modeling detail. And what I mean by modeling detail is not the actual final texture that I see, but the form of what I see and the value of what I see. So instead of modeling every single um, rock that I see in there. I'm just going to be blocking in uh, with a tighter degree of precision uh, the detail that I see. And I save that final detail for the next layer. So there are going to be some things throughout this stage that I leave unresolved, unfinished. And the reason for that, again, is that I want that focus to be for the final layer, not this one. So to recap the structure of the, the process, I started with lines, started with the, the, the shapes and things defined by the lines and some light value. And then the blocking stage was to resolve the composition to a point where I could see what was happening, but not to spend so much time on it that I end up wasting time essentially by putting in too much detail and then changing everything later. So the block in is simply a way of establishing the overall concept of the image without resolving anything to a finish. 
So that's what the block in was. Now, this stage, again, is just to take the block in a step further and model in the, uh, the shapes and the values and get overall the um, finished look of the painting without putting in any of those final details. That will become more and more apparent as we go. So I believe I finished with the sky and at this point I'm mixing up a color for the mountains. And just as I did with the sky, I'm going to test it a few times. Just put a dot here and there and check to see if I've got the value that I want and also that the color I want is there. So there's two things. I'm looking for the value and I'm looking for the hue. And I'll bump it around and I'll mix new colors and I'll keep bumping it around until I find what I want. And then I will set about the task of putting in those modeling details. Now, as far as the detail goes, this mountain is pretty far away. So I have to be careful not to put in too much detail because I want the majority of the contrast, in other words, the lightest values and the darkest values and the most amount of detail to be in the foreground. So I have to keep that in mind at all times as I put in this layer. And it makes sense because this layer isn't about final detail anyway. This, this is just modeling. This is taking those blocky shapes back there and giving them some more definition. I know I haven't mentioned this yet, but I am using a flat. This is a Monarch brush from Windsor & Newton, and it is a size 6 flat. Now I find that the flats are really effective at putting in mountain detail. You know, uh, anything that has a, a rocky texture to it. These flat brushes work really well for that. I don't have a lot of paint on the brush. Uh, I know at some point it might look like I do, but I really don't. It's all of a very uh, subtle application, basically just building up the surface slowly as I, as I go. And again, I haven't cut anything out, so you'll see every time I load the brush. You won't see every time I've cleaned it, but you'll, you'll kind of be able to get an idea of when I clean the brush because it'll drop out of the frame or I'll, I'll have a blend or some, you know, a crossfade or something, and you'll, <laughs> you'll see that. So like right there, I might have cleaned the brush or at least wiped it out a little bit. But I have set this up so the palette is right next to the painting and uh, I don't have to do any jump cuts. So you'll get to see it in real time as I paint this thing.
Something I will mention here is that since I've got somewhat more of a sunset scene, the sun is casting a nice warm glow on everything. And it's a good idea, especially in landscapes, but you can do this in any type of painting, really. If you've got a warm light, like my sun here, the shadows are typically going to be cool. So on the highlight side, I've got all these warm tones. And it isn't that the mountain changes color on the shadow side. <laughs> the mountain's all the same color. But since the light source is warm, anything that the light touches is going to be warm as well. And where the light doesn't touch directly, you're going to be seeing light that is bounced off of the sky, off of the clouds, off, their, off of um, other land masses and things like that. So the overall tone is going to be much cooler. It's especially apparent in landscapes because of that relationship between the, the blue of the sky and the warmth of the sun. So that's a theme I have going on here as well, the, the warm versus the cool colors and the, uh, the highlight versus the shadow. Now I had to make a cut right there because my battery died and uh, I had to recharge the, the camera battery. So there's all of a sudden there's this, uh, this lighter value over there on the mountain, but that's essentially what happened. I, I will admit that much got lost, but we're back up and running and the rest of this is done exactly the same way. So you're not really missing anything. So the, the application is very light, like I was saying before, and I've created a, a bit of a tonal scale there on the palette. And the, the shadow color is made using a combination of burnt umber and ultramarine. And I just mixed that into the blue that I already had. So the mark making is important, especially when you're trying to describe rocks and uh, you know rocky surface like this mountainside. I use the edge of the brush quite a bit and I also use the corner. And that's just to suggest the breaks in the, in the rocky formations to suggest where there's light reflected off those clouds in the sky and where there's shadow. Uh, because even in the shadow, you're, you're not going to have a perfectly flat surface just because the sun's not hitting it. There's still variation in there created by rocks that, that jut out and there's recesses and there's parts that face the, the sky directly. And there's also some snow there, which I'm going to add later, probably in the next stage. But all of that is taken into account when you're modeling in this detail here. I don't want to create a flat wash of this blue color. It needs to have the, the rocky appearance of the highlight side, but it needs to exist within its own tonal range and its own, you know, its own range of colors. So it's the, it's the play between light and shadow, even though I'm completely in shadow here. So again, there's ultramarine and uh, burnt umber to create that darker shade. There is no black in this painting. There is not going to be any black in this painting. I typically don't use black. The only time I'll use black is if I need to make a value that's darker than the ultramarine and the blue can make. Now the, the ultramarine, I'm sorry, the umber and the blue, the uh, burnt umber and ultramarine blue, when mixed together, can make a color that's almost black. It's about 90, 96, 97% of the way there, but it's not true black. If I happen to have a shadow that I need to put in there that's darker than that color combination, I will reach for some ivory black, but only in that situation. It's not likely that I'm going to have an area in this painting that's that dark.
you can see that the application here is very um, very thin and what I mean by that is you can see through it on the palette it's a different kind of thin <laughs> not to be confused with the oil content of my paint I'm talking about the um, the thickness of the layer there on my palette it's, it's very transparent which means it's very thin you can see through it and again I'm not really interested in putting the paint on too thick I know that this has to dry and I have to paint over it and my next layer is going to be mostly glazes with the exception of the foreground I have a different strategy for the foreground but this is, uh, I guess it's a very tedious process, but it's very rewarding because the, the longer you stick to it, the, the more things start to develop and it actually starts looking like what you want it to look like. But you can't be in a rush. It's, uh, it's never about being in a rush. This painting is five by seven inches and this, this stage alone takes me I guess it took me about two, two and a half hours. You know, I did take some breaks. Occasionally I sit back and I think about what I want to do. And as I said before, I cut all of that out. So just watching this, it looks like I'm painting for an hour and a half straight, but that's not really what happened. You need to get up and stretch once in a while. At least once every, I don't know, 20 minutes, 30 minutes walk away from it, do something else for a little while and come back. That's pretty much how this happened. But if I did that, this video would be pretty boring. So you're only seeing me paint. I'm just developing the mountain still. Working my way from the most distant part of the mountain which is on the right over there to the the left hand side which is closer to us there is a gradual shift in value from light to dark so the parts of the mountain that are closer are going to be darker than those parts that are farther away now in my in my second painting stage, the, the final paint layer, uh, I'll be putting a little bit of snow in there. And also I might include a little bit of the sky glow over that ridge just to set it back there even farther. Um, I'm thinking that's what I'm going to do. That's my plan. So I'm not going to worry about it now. So now I've mixed up a shadow color, a dark, and I'm going back in around the base of the mountain and I'm adding in some, some darker areas to break up the, uh, the flatness of what I did there. And that's fine. It's not a problem. Just seeing what I did, I didn't like what I did, so I'm going and putting that dark back in there. A lot of the painting process is just going for it and putting it in and seeing what happens. And if you don't like it, you change it, which is essentially what I'm doing right now. When I saw what I had done, I felt like I had covered up too much of the dark. And I still feel like the way I resolved this, I left it a little bit too dark. Um, I'm sorry, I left it a little bit too light up towards that uh, that light ridge there. So in the final layer, I uh, I think I'll address that as well. The angle of the brush is important. You'll see that I constantly 
turn the brush in my hand, and that's to, to make sure that that flat edge is facing the right way. You can't just go at it. You have to pay attention to which, uh, to the orientation of your brush. See here's just the corner, more of a flat, and it, it, it helps to turn the brush like that to create some texture. But there is a an overall slope there that the mountain has, and the majority of the marks have to communicate that slope. Otherwise, the mountain won't make sense. Now, I spend a bit of time working on this, and it's it's really just trying to resolve the the shape and the the uh, the value structure of the mountain itself, and um, I'll keep working on it until I get it the way I want it. Here I'm toying with the idea of having the ridge be a little bit darker. See how well that works out. Uh, I do, like I said, I, I do plan on going back in there and putting some snow on the, the peaks, so this may end up getting covered, but I'm just seeing what happens really at this point. Definitely going off script. This is not what my reference looks like. This is definitely taking artistic license and changing it. And uh, now that I've got it there, I can assess that and see if I like it. And if I don't, I'll lighten it back up again. It's as simple as that. Define that, that ridge a little bit more while I'm at it. I did push the peak up a little bit. I didn't feel like I had the right shape in the block end, so I... I lifted the mountain up a little bit. I think it was about a centimeter. And I think it helps a lot. That in combination with lowering that peak on the left, I, I really just think that's what it needed. I see here I'm going back in with the light because I, I didn't like that dark so much. It's okay. You can, you can fix things like this. That's all part of the process. Now I did clean the brush and get a new color. Just cut that out. This value is darker because I'm moving closer in space now. Cleaning the brush again. That's probably the only time I cleaned the brush and I left. I didn't cut that out. Eh. Oh well. Yeah, let's lift that back up a little bit. Put some shadows in there. See, I am thinking that there is going to be some snow here. So I'm, I'm really just trying to define the, uh, you know, the overall shape and contour of that mountain. I suppose you could say, well, I don't think you should put any snow in there. And I don't know, maybe I won't. Right now I'm planning to put snow in there, at least on the peaks. But you never know, after a week of letting this sit and dry, I might think, uh, I kind of like it the way it is. I've lived with it for a week, and I can't think of anything that would help it, uh, anything that the snow would do to benefit. I don't know. We'll see. That'll be a surprise. A lot of it also depends on what happens in the foreground. Because um, that mountain is definitely turning into more of a focal point. So if it were not a focal point, I definitely wouldn't be 
thinking about putting too much detail back there to distract from whatever the focal point is. But the current plot or the, the plan for the current painting is that that is going to be a focal point. So I do want to be careful about how I treat it. Now getting into the shadows of these closer ridges here. You'll notice that the color is a little bit more saturated. It has a higher chroma. The further away you get into the distance, the, uh, the, the chroma dies a little bit and becomes a little bit less uh, prominent. You know, and what I mean is the color is less saturated the further away it is. So here in the foreground, uh, well, this isn't really the foreground, but here are the, the closer peaks of that mountain range. The color is a little bit more saturated, as you can see there. Keeping an eye on your values and your your chroma levels, you know, your, your saturation, all of that really contributes to the, the sense of depth that you get in your painting. So don't just randomly put colors in there. You know, pay attention to your value structure and pay attention to the, the, the saturation of your colors. I want to keep that full tonal range that full range of saturation in the foreground. The reason for that is that there is much less atmosphere between the viewer and the foreground than there is between the viewer and the background where the, where the mountain is. So it's just going to appear lighter and uh, less saturated, you know, with less contrast just by nature. Unless it's a really clear day, there's always going to be a little bit of atmospheric haze, a little bit of uh, what's called atmospheric perspective happening. And the more of it you put in there, the further back you can put your, uh, your distant uh, elements. So here I'm completely changing things. Um, bet you can't guess what this is. I decided it needed a river. So I took the same colors there that I was using on the mountain and I just decided to put in a river. I said, this needs some interest. You know, that's a really large area down there that doesn't have a lot going on and it, it needs to be broken up by something. And the first thing I thought of was, oh, I'll put a river in there. So using the same brush and keeping it relatively horizontal like that um, most of the time. I go ahead and lay this river in here. Now by this point, I'm thinking the, the foreground is really going to have some uh, closeness to it. So there's going to be some trees, some, some foliage, and maybe some stones, maybe even a trail, little pathway, who knows. Um, all of that is not planned out at this point. Uh, I'm just going to more or less wing it and see what happens. But for now, I'm thinking that this river is really going to help give us some sense of scale, because I think that's one of the things that was missing. And you'll notice you'll notice that I took those trees out, um, the you know from the left hand side there, because they totally weren't helping the composition at all. They were just distracting, and by pushing that blue over them, I've, I've muted them, taken them out, so they're not so prominent anymore, and there's a much more defined focus to the overall composition now. There's several ways you can control the way your viewers look at your painting. See, by having the river come out from behind that mountain range, I'm now saying specifically that there is distance between those um, that rocky um, mountain on the right and the distant mountain that I've already painted there. The river just gives us a sense of scale and helps us to understand visually that there is a distance there. There's a difference in, in the planes there. 
And what that distance is, well, maybe it's not so easy to tell. But you can use elements like the atmospheric perspective to help communicate how much distance there is. Little elements like this, uh, this river just sort of help get that message across. I'm not going to worry too much about the bottom of the painting. That's uh, The plan is to cover that up, so I'm not going to bother painting it. I'll just refine the shoreline here a little bit and then move on. So now what I'm doing is giving a little bit of variation to the river. I don't want it to be the same color. You'll notice I've gotten the shadow of the mountain in there as the river goes back around behind that ridge. And that's just to help to put it in the space. Now I've decided to go and adjust this ridge a little bit. Sometimes I jump back and forth between, you know, I'll just get an idea and I'll think, oh, I need to take care of that right now. And I'll stop what I'm doing and I'll go and change it. And that's what happened there. Now to mix up a dark, it's going to be primarily burnt umber and ultramarine blue. That specific color is ultramarine deep, and that's just the, uh, the name that Rembrandt gave it. But it is ultramarine blue. So some burnt umber, ultramarine, and a little bit of red. I, I know there was a touch of red in there, um, but I am definitely um, working on a darker color here for the middle ground and it's uh, this ridge here has some i guess it's like a uh, a ledge with some shadow under it and that's what this is and there's a little bit of a grassy area on top of it which i'll put in later so the way i attack this is and i say attack but approach, I guess, would be a better word. I'm thinking that there's trees here, and I want to make sure that I convey a sense of scale. So my brush marks here are going to be short and I almost want to say stabby, if that's a word, <laughs> uh, just to uh, suggest that there are treetops in between these shadows. See, by keeping the brush vertical like that and just stabbing down at it, I can create a sense that there's some trees there. And then I can go in and refine them later with lighter colors. Now here I'm going to carry some of that tone over into these rocks. And uh, at this point I'm thinking it's, it's not imperative that I nail this, that I get this absolutely perfect because I'm, uh, I'm planning to add some trees in the foreground which would cover most of this. So I'm not going to spend too much time developing this area. 
I may end up putting so many trees in there that you can't even see this. It, it's just a, a matter of going with it and sort of seeing what I have and then making decisions and deciding, you know, what to do, how many trees to put in there, what's best for the composition, things like that. Now over on the other side, I'm going to balance that out with some shadows over here. And as with the right hand side, I'm also thinking that there are going to be trees here as well. So I don't want to develop this too much, but I do want something there just in case any of these, uh, any of the area back here peeks through the trees. I want to be able to see it and, you know, I don't, I don't just want it to be a a big block of color like it is just trying to break it up a little bit so yeah i'm just carrying that up uh, try to define these rocks a little bit And that flat brush is still coming in pretty useful. I don't think I've changed it. I know uh, at some point I do change to a filbert, but it's um, so far this uh, number six flat has stolen the show. The color I'm mixing here is going to be a uh, lighter, a lighter value to fill in some of those spaces between the shadows that I put in because there's a, there's, like I said, there's a rocky sort of rocky ledge there and you have really deep shadows and then you have shadows that are uh, a bit lighter that are receiving some cast light from the sky. So they're, they're more blue more of a slate blue color and you'll see here this is where they go so the the really dark color i put in there is the is the deep shadow and this is a the lighter shadow all of it helps to tie the painting together because the sky without the sun if, let's just say the sun disappeared but the sky remained the same uh, the entire scene would have this blue cast to it, almost look like twilight. So the areas that aren't directly lit by the sun are still going to have that nice blue bounce to them. and That's what all of this is. It's an interesting way of thinking about painting when when you realize what it is you're doing say i'm putting in shadows these are areas that are not receiving direct sunlight they're shadow they're receiving a bounce light from the sky so it's blue i'm not actually putting in lines and blue colors what i'm doing is i'm painting shadows it's kind of a, a negative painting you know, the positive side of it would be painting the highlights, painting the light side, and the, the negative side of it is the, the areas that aren't directly hit by the sun. So I'm painting rocks. I'm painting the crevices and stuff in between those rocks. It's not just blue shapes. Now this color... I'm going to work on this for a little bit because there's a very specific color I'm looking for. It's a it's green. 
It's it's for trees. Trust me, it'll get there. Uh, but it's also uh, it's also being lit by the sun, so it's got that warm glow to it, and it, it's very very specific. And I have to get it right. So you're you're going to see me work on this for a little while, just pushing that color around. The first thing I'm trying to do is capture that warmth, and then I start to add the blue and the brown to it to mute it down and get it closer to green where it's supposed to be. And this is all just part of the color mixing process. This is how I mix my colors. There's still paint on the brush up near the ferrule that I utilize. And it's fun because um, every color in this painting is made from the same five piles. So there's no way I can make a bad color. It's, it's just a matter of getting just the right amount of each one in there. It's fun knowing that you can't make mud. <laughs> you know, there's no there's no paint in there's no pigment in here in any of those colors that's going to ruin it. So I skipped ahead a little bit. Still working on it. Well, I worked on it longer than I thought I did, but that's okay. And there we go. Everything in this area is very warm because it's all lit by the, the setting sun here. This part was challenging because it, it needs to be far away. So none of the details can be too sharp. Otherwise, it's going to look a little strange because the, uh, the mountain isn't that sharp yet. I don't have those final details in there. And what I don't want to get caught up in is final detail. And it's really hard to do that when you're trying to put in all these little trees. So you'll see me working on this quite a bit to soften it without it having the appearance of a flat shape. You know, there's there's got to be variation in there. But at the same time, I need to keep it loose because it's not at that final stage yet. There's a lot of back and forth going on here. You'll, you'll see me putting these lighter tones in and then I, I get the dark and I put the dark back in and I, I go back and forth. Now it's very strange because I usually tell people, especially my students, you should have more than one brush. One of them to handle the highlights and one of them to handle the shadows. But in this particular case, I did the entire painting with the same brush. Well, this much of it anyway. I do switch to a filbert. It's very interesting how the color looks green over those blue areas because it mixed with the, the dark that was down there. Oh, there's my filbert. But it, it mixed with the green that was down, or, um, the blue that was down there and it turned green. And now I'm being um, specific about making a green. Put that in as my uh, shadow color. But it's a warm green, you know, it's not green green. It still makes sense within the context of the light. If it were a cool green, it wouldn't work as well. Uh, 
I think that the uh, cool colors need to be reserved for larger shadow areas. And again, this isn't the final detail, so if I if I get the rest of the painting in there and determine that it needs to be changed, I can always change it in the second painting stage. At this point, it's still not looking right. It still looks a little too defined, and the colors aren't there yet. I think in the end, I ended up leaving it a little bit too saturated, and that's only because I didn't have the foreground in there yet. If I had planned on putting the foreground in from the beginning, I would have blocked it in in the previous layer. But since I didn't do that, I don't have it there to reference. So it becomes a little difficult at this point to get the saturation level correct, not knowing what the foreground is going to look like. But I always have the ability to go in there with a glaze in my uh, in my final detail layer and desaturate that with a little bit of white, and that's probably what I'll end up doing. I need to make sure that the the uh, the area that I'm working on here sits properly in space. If it's too saturated, it's going to look like it's too close. But the scale of the trees says that it's really far away, so I have to make sure that everything makes sense. Now going back in with some darker detail. This is uh, my filbert now. It's the same um, monarch line. And the only reason I switched is because the, uh, the flat wasn't really doing what I wanted it to do and I needed something with a, a little bit more of a point. It's still um, looking a little saturated to me, and uh, I know I probably wasn't thinking that when I painted this. But when I get the foreground in there, you'll see this this section right here needs a, a little bit of desaturation, which I can do with a glaze. Now here I'm carrying the darker color up into the rocks and I'm going to try to define them a little bit more. The filbert gives me a nice thin line like that if I very lightly skim over the surface. And this is one of those areas where I like to go back and forth. The overall effect of it I know I keep saying this, but the overall effect of it is that there's still a little bit too much saturation in there. But when I get the foreground in and the saturation level of the foreground is there in the same place, that's when I'll really be able to tell. But there's always that nagging feeling. Uh, that it needs to be desaturated a little bit. 
you kind of have to develop an eye for that. You know, if, if you're just starting out and you don't really, you know, you're more um, focused on getting the the technique down and the, the brush strokes and everything, and you're trying to figure all that out. It's it it's sometimes a little difficult to to get the colors right, especially in this case where I'm going a little bit off script. I'm not I'm not looking at the reference to do this. I'm kind of feeling it out, and uh, you know, without making the video you know six hours long it's uh, it's one of those things where i know this isn't the final layer i know i have another layer coming and i know i can fix things so i don't dwell on any one particular spot for too long because i know i can change it Saturation of that color looks good. I'm okay with that. But those trees down there, I, I still think need to be pushed back a little bit. There isn't really much to say about putting in rock detail. I mean, it's just a, a matter of drawing in all those little cracks and things that you see. And I did look back at the reference to put those shapes in there. But uh, again, it's, it's probably all going to get covered up by trees anyway. So there isn't really much point in worrying too much about it. Now I'm back to the flat. Um, I do, I do think that the flat is a better choice for putting in rocks and, and things like this where I, where I need a line. I'll use it to, uh, define the, the face of these rocks as well. And that's pretty effective. This area here that I'm working on the top of that rock face, that's, I'm probably going to leave that, um, leave that alone because the, uh, the foreground is going to cover up a lot of this and I want it to peek through there but I don't want it to be too distracting and uh, it just a lot of it depends on what I end up doing in the foreground and you don't always know you know sometimes you can plan the whole thing out but when you're painting like this especially if you're you know you're, you're making things up as you go it, it Sometimes you'll you'll be working on it and you'll think, oh well, I'm I'm pretty happy with that. And then you spend all this time working on all this detail and you think, oh, it's it's great, I love it. And then you get to your foreground and you put your foreground in and you end up covering all of it and you're like, oh, why didn't I just leave it alone? Why did I do that? But that's part of the fun, and you know, I, I think that the painting has more of a life that way whatever it is you're doing you know it has a history kind of keeps it from being static
Now this is a uh, this is actually something strategic. There's a there isn't enough of a value difference there between the the um, the foreground rocks that I'm working on and the blue of the mountain behind them. I mean, if you were to look at this in black and white those two areas might blend together. So what I'm doing right here is I'm putting some lights in front of that to separate it a little bit more. And, and it's, that works really well. But again, I'm <laughs> uh, just going to let you know I'm probably going to cover all that with trees. So it's only there uh, to fill in the space if anything happens to show through the trees. Pretty satisfied with that. It looks pretty good. And now all of a sudden the trees down there don't look quite so out of place. It's fun how all that happens. Yeah, it still might need a little bit of desaturation, but that's something that can, like I said, that can be easily taken care of with a with a glaze of some transparent white. Just working on this bank here, and uh, then we'll move on. This is, I do need a little bit more detail in the water. I'm thinking that I can put in some more details here and then work on that water later. You know, now that I've got the bank in there, it needs some, it needs some water lines, you know, it needs some ripples there along the, along the shore. But I could put those in later. Now here I'm establishing where the foreground plane is going to break. There's a, uh, a slope that I want to follow. I want to keep the movement of the painting moving from the upper right area to the lower left area. I want that the composition to have that nice sweep from the upper right to the lower left. So the the foreground is going to carry that over. So again, this is just establishing where it is. I'm going to have some grass, maybe a, a few rocks, some foliage, some trees up there. And uh, you should be able to tell now why I didn't put the river down there. <laughs> uh, didn't want that blue mixing with my, my green here. So this is a darker brown. And remember, if I need black, I just mix the ultramarine into the burnt umber, which is what I'm going to do for the trees. I'm only going to block in the trees uh, because I want the initial shapes to dry before I go and put the detail in there. So the trees won't be resolved in this layer they'll just be blocked in. And again, this is partly due to the reason, or I mean, partly due to the fact that I did not block in any trees before because it wasn't part of the original plan I had. But since I decided to put in the trees, they have to be blocked in before I can resolve them. So when I do get to the trees, there will be no detail put on them at this point. I still have to follow the, the method, you know, I have to block them in, let the block in dry, and then I can put the detail on top.
Now I do have pure white. I think I should mention this. I do have pure white on the on the palette there, but with the exception of the first two or three colors I mixed, um, haven't touched it. I mixed in a little bit of the lighter value to you know to make this green here, but I didn't take the white. I pulled the the color mixture I had made before, and uh, every single color on that palette has varying degrees of white, yellow, red, blue, and brown in them. Uh, but that's it. The colors all harmonize with each other because they're all made from the same five pigments. If I started adding, you know, three different reds, maybe two different yellows, and uh, a whole bunch of blues, even a thalo, oh boy, I, I'd be in for a a little bit of difficulty there, but by controlling the palette and only using those five colors, I can I can keep control over the colors. I know what's going to happen. It's very predictable. I suppose you could say the same if you added different blues, different you know different colors. You, you just have to learn how they work and how they operate together. But what I've found is that I can mix ninety percent of the colors that I see around me with those five, and I don't need any more. Now see, there's that very dark color, and that's mostly just burnt umber and ultramarine blue. And I can shift it to a warmer black by using more umber, and I can shift it to a cooler black by using more blue. Now here I'm just using the edge of that flat to create my tree trunks. And then I'll use the corner to put in the leaves. I have to decide where I want the top of that tree to be. And I'm just tapping. I'm not. I'm not pulling. I'm not doing anything but just touching the the tips of those bristles to the canvas. And now for the leaves, it's the same thing. Just uh, using the corner, just tapping. Varying amounts of blue and brown to change the warmth or coolness of the the color. Making sure that I've got it groomed, nice chiseled edge, and I go ahead and put in more leaves. Now I'll continue to flesh out this tree and all I'm really concerned about at this point is the silhouette. I'm not interested in any detail other than the outlines, the silhouette of the tree. The goal is to block in the shape and then when it's dry, go in there with the detail. So with these trees or with regard to these trees, I will be resolving them completely in the final layer. Of course, there's no rule saying I can't do a fifth layer. <laughs> you know, just go back in and do more detail over the tops of the trees, and who knows, maybe I'll do that. But the goal right now is to get them resolved in the next layer, because I just, I don't think that I'll need any more, um, any more than that. I'm very meticulous about where I put the leaves. I don't just randomly put the shapes in there. I, I pay attention to the the clumps of the foliage, you know, the the branches. And I try not to make it too symmetrical. As a matter of fact, the way I leave the trees at the end of this stage is actually a little bit too symmetrical. I, I know that when I go to paint the final layer, I will break that up a little bit. Um, you can't see that yet because I haven't gotten that far, but you'll see what I mean when I start to put the trees in around this one. There I just made a decision to make that tree taller, so I extended it, no problem. The overall shape of the foliage here on this tree is kind of a zigzag shape. And uh, you know, it's broken up here and there, but the general shape of it is uh, pretty much just what I've got there.
very meticulous, <laughs> very specific about where those branches go. I want to make sure that the tree has a, an appealing shape to it. And you'll notice I strategically placed that tree so that it breaks the, the, the plane of the mountains behind it in such a way that I can't see that transition. By doing that, I've, I've essentially used the shapes of the ridges to point to the tree. Just a subtle little thing I paid some attention to. And um, specifically why I made the tree taller was so that it didn't cut horizontally across from the top of the mountain peak. I try not to allow things to um, follow patterns unless it contributes positively to the composition. So by making that tree a little bit taller, I've, I've supported the slope I was talking about before, that, um, that downward sweep from upper right to lower left. And the tops of these trees will follow that same guideline. Be mindful of tangents. And what I mean by tangents is when you're putting in trees, make sure that the tip of the tree doesn't intersect with some other line, um, like that mountain ridge behind it. Something else I'd like to call attention to is now that I've got this really dark value going in the foreground, the trees in the middle ground next to that river are becoming more and more um, tied into the painting. Whereas before they stood out um, pretty heavily because of their saturation level. And now they don't look so bad. So we'll see what ends up happening. It'll be interesting. Now here I'm just sort of carving out this uh, this uh, grassy area that's here. Not too sure what I'm going to do with it yet. I'll probably put a bush there or something, but for now it's just going to be grass. I really spend a lot of time uh, modeling this this ground here. Um, in the detail stage, I'll come back to this and actually put some grass in here. But this is a pretty good example of what modeling is. It's um, it's staying away from the temptation to put grass in here right now, and just getting the shapes finalized. the The slope of the ground, for example, like I have it there. And then the grass comes later, and I'll strategically put it uh, here and there in the light, and um, that'll, you know, I, that way I won't have to paint every single blade of grass, just more or less wherever the light is hitting it. And in the shadows, maybe I won't put so much grass. So all I really have to do is make sure that the 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 general shape of things is in, and. This is sort of a, a block in anyway, so I'm not too concerned about it. I know I can fix it later. It's not looking too bad though.
And pay attention to what I'm doing with the treetops here. See how they slope down from upper right to lower left? They follow the shape of that slope behind it. And uh, the distant mountain as well has that same downward slope. Now here I'm playing around with the idea of light and shadow on the ground. I am going to put some more trees in there on the left, but for now I'm just working on the ground. I'm really thinking that the play of the light here will help support the composition. It'll, it'll really look nice having um, patches of light and dark. Um, created by the tree shadows here. Now this tree specifically, you can see where the paint was put on thinly or, you know, lightly where the mountain is versus the heavier application down towards the bottom where all that paint is from where I was doing the trees. It's, it becomes a little bit more difficult once I get down there and I have to keep reloading the brush more often simply because there's more paint down there, but this is how you make it work. You just cake the paint on there. And since this is a tree, it's okay that it has the texture. It doesn't need to be smooth. Um, but you can see how much paint is on that. And this, of course, will take longer to dry, but that's okay because I'm not in a rush. Just let it dry and Next week, I'll come back to it, see what I want to do. I really enjoy having that time away from the work in between layers. If I were to just go at this all at once, uh, I don't think that the final result would be as strong. Of course, there's nothing wrong with that, but this is just the way I like to do it. I like to, I like to work on it. I like to walk away, do something else for a little while, come back. The natural drying process of the paint forces me to do that, and it's a good thing. I don't like to use anything like Liquin that speeds up the drying of my paint. I, I really just like to let it happen naturally. So here again, I'm just blocking in the shapes of the trees, and naturally it's mixing with the color underneath and giving me some variation. But since this is a block in, the color variations don't matter too much. I know I'm going to be highlighting these trees and I know I'm going to be in, enhancing the shadows and everything. So it's all going to come together in the next layer. Right now I'm just concerned about those silhouettes, like I said before. And now one more little tree on this side. And I'm going to leave the river visible. I'm not going to put a tree in front of the river, and that's on purpose, because I want to be able to see the tree. And the, the top of the grass there is my, my separator. So once I get this tree in, I'll put some on the left and um, wrap this layer up. What I'm doing now is I'm mixing up another 
black. It's essentially just the brown and the blue together. You have to be careful when you mix black because if you have any other colors on your brush, especially white, your black is always going to be a little milky. Uh, the only way to really mix the black is to get a nice clean brush. And that's the only color that that brush has in it, right? Just the brown and the blue. You just have to be careful because if you get any white into that, it's going to be milky and there's nothing you can do about it. You'll have to use it for something else. So at this point, the painting is beginning to come together for me. I, I'm really, uh, you know, at this point I start to get excited when I start getting these, um, these foreground details in and the painting is coming together. I, I, I really start thinking about where I can take it and what I can do. But giving the painting the time it needs to dry is going to allow me to consider every option I have and make the best decision going forward. So I'll just put in these uh, last few trees and polish up the foreground a little bit and uh, we'll call it a day here. The trees are all done the same way. First by doing the trunk and uh, establishing where the bottom of it is and then just uh, going in and painting in those shapes and making sure that the, uh, the shapes of the trees make sense and everything's in good shape. I'm thinking that the uh, the trees here need to be a little bit more dense. So what I might end up doing in the next layer is adding uh, a few more trees just to fill in some more space, but I don't want to cover too much of my background, so I just have to be careful. I'll uh, consider where I'm going to put those while the painting is drying. Now remember here, I'm putting in shadows and I'm establishing the shapes of the trees. It's, uh, it's very easy to start thinking about putting in highlights, but right now I just want to make sure that I have the trees in and the, the shapes are there. And all of that detail I'm anxious to get in there is going to come later. Well, I don't have too much more to say. It's just a matter of getting these trees in here and maybe considering what I'm going to do in the background behind those trees. If I fill in more trees, the, uh, the background isn't going to matter so much. But one of the things that I have to mention here is that I wasn't thinking about the foreground when I stopped working on those mountains back there, so I'll have to deal with that one way or another. Either I add more trees and cover it up, or I resolve it a little bit with some background trees like I did on the right-hand side of the river. Again, that's something I have the ability to think about while I let this thing dry.
Notice here as I put the detail on these trees how I twist the brush around. It's, uh, it's never just the same angle all the time. I, I twist it around, I, I switch, I use the other, uh, other corner, I use the flat. It's all just it's all just to create different shapes so that it doesn't look too uniform. I'm, I'm trying to avoid patterns, essentially. Nature doesn't create too many patterns in trees like this, so the, the more you can break it up and make it look organic, the better. And the best way to do that is to root, you know, rotate the brush around, move it around in your fingers as you, as you put them in. Ah uh, yes, now I'm going to go back and put in those uh, those water lines I was talking about. While I'm doing this, I'm paying attention to the sky. I don't at any point want a reflection of the sky to be lighter than the sky. So that's something you, you know, you should always be aware of when you're when you're painting a reflection. It should at least be the same brightness, but it should never be brighter than the light source. In which case in this case it's the sky. So the river itself has to be darker than that sky. And that's where I'm going to leave it for now. So I'd like to thank you for joining me, and we'll be back in about a week with the final painting layer. I hope you guys have a great week, and I'll see you again next time.